All right, so uh, the goal today is to talk about um, hidden Markov models and biological sequence analysis. So what we're gonna do is introduce uh, first Bayesian inference and Bayes rule and just simple intuitions for that. Then we're gonna couple those, uh, you know, this Bayesian inference concept with a temporal components of a Markov chain. And then we're gonna look at some examples of hidden Markov models, starting with a very simple concept of a background sequence versus a CPG rich promoter sequence. And we're gonna look at a series of algorithms for working with hidden Markov models. And then uh, first of all, how do we sum up a sequence? How do we uh, infer the best path? How do we score over all paths? Then we're gonna do a digression over uh, remembering more, so increasing the state space. And then we're gonna switch to posterior decoding and then learning, which is totally, awesomely cool. So we have two lectures to cover this, but uh, let's see how much we get through today. So how do we model biological sequences using hidden Markov model? So here we are in module one of the class on aligning and modeling genomes. We talked about alignment uh, with dynamic programming. We talked uh, about alignment with hashing and rapid string search. And today we're talking about here Markov models. So what have we learned so far? We've basically learned about dynamic programming, which is gonna be a concept that we're gonna to reuse today in the context of here Markov models. And we, we're gonna, we learned also about um, linear time string matching and really fast search. And today we're gonna to be talking about decoding, evaluation, parsing, and learning using uh, here Markov models. So a lot of what we've learned today is, you know, very helpful. So basically we've learned about sequence alignment, about rapid string search. We're gonna learn about comparative genomics and whole genome assembly. And all of these are basically together uh, giving you a, an arsenal of tools for what to do with a new DNA sequence. So uh, based on all that, you can ask, well, if I get a new genome sequence, uh, you know, a new segment of DNA, how can I find out something about its function? So one of the things that I can do is basically try to infer um, something about that sequence. So what are some ideas about what you would do if you have, you know, I, I don't know, there's a, there's a virus going around and you find a new uh, DNA sequence in the genome of some patients, what would you do with that sequence? So the first thing that you can do is basically align it to things that you know about. So that's database search. That's what we saw about last time. So basically, you know, back in, I don't know, December 19, when they first found a sample of a patient with this new respiratory virus, they basically said, okay, great. We have a new piece of DNA. Let's search it against the database. And what they found was a match with coronavirus. That's the first thing. The second thing you could do is basically align it to things you don't know about. So you could basically say, well, I have a lot of patients with this respiratory disorder. Let me now align all of these sequences against each other. So that's you know, a form of genome assembly or a form of genome alignment. You can also stare at the sequence and basically say, well, do I notice anything funny about it? I see three Gs here. I see another three Gs here. Well, maybe a bunch of Gs is a pattern. So you could look for a non-standard nucleotide composition. You could look for interesting KMER frequencies. We talked about three MERS with GGG, but you could, allow, you could look for four MERS or degenerate 10 MERS and so on and so forth. You could look for recurrent patterns or, and that's sort of the topic of today, you can model. You can basically say, is there some kind of generative model that allows me to create more examples of that type of sequence. So modeling basically means we're gonna build hypotheses about the observations that we have in the natural world, that we're gonna build a generative model to describe the thing that we're seeing. And not all modeling is generative, there's some discriminative models that are non-generative, but you can in general use generative models as discriminative models as we're gonna be uh, looking at today. So what does a generative model mean? That means that you have a process through which you can generate examples, you can sample more sequences of that type. So the concept of modeling is that there's gonna be a type 
a type of sequence that we're going to be looking for more of. So the goal for today is how do we model DNA sequences and more generally, how do we model biological processes or any kind of data process uh, out there? So if I have a DNA sequence, I would like to know that perhaps there are different classes of functional elements in the DNA. A class of functional elements could be promoters and maybe promoters have particular signatures that I can recognize about. And maybe introns have other signatures and CBG islands have other signatures. So the, the question is, what do you do with a big unlabeled region of DNA? So the three components, the three tools that HMMs are gonna allow us to do is how to emit, how to recognize, and how to learn the distinguishing characteristic of each state. What does emitting mean? Emitting DNA sequences of a certain type means that we're not looking for an exact alignment to a previous gene. Instead, we're looking to preserve the properties of the type, but not necessarily the identical sequence of the type. For example, the property could be that there's a lot of C's and G's. It's not an alignment. It's not like I'm going to sort of put the C's and the genes in the same place. It's that compositionally, there's just more C's and G's no matter where they're found. So who's with me so far in this whole concept of um, distinguishing an exact alignment versus a class of elements that is distinguished by its characteristics rather than its exact sequence. Awesome. Good. So uh, 197300, this is great. So uh, that's the first part. So being able to emit DNA sequences of a certain type. The second one, is being able to recognize DNA sequences of a certain type. So the first one basically says, I'm gonna follow the arrow down in this direction. I can build a model for what CPG islands look like, and then I can generate more CPG islands. I can build a model for what introns look like and generate more intron-like examples. So that basically uh, is going forward on this arrow. The second bullet is going up on this arrow. It's basically saying, how can I recognize DNA sequences of a certain type? How, did, how can I distinguish whether this chunk of sequence that I have is an intron or a first exon? Namely, what I want to know is what hidden state is more likely to have generated the particular example sequence that I'm looking at than other hidden states. In other words, if I observe the sequence, is it more likely to have been generated by a promoter or is it more likely to be, have been generated by an intern? So the question is what hidden state is the most likely to have generated the particular observations? And more broadly, across a very long sequence, how do we find the set of states and transitions between these states that generated a long sequence? So let's see who's with me so far on the second part. So the first part is going down the arrow. The second part is going back up the arrow and basically recognizing what hidden state most likely gave rise to the observation that I have of my particular sequence. Whereas the first part is saying I'm in an intron state and I want to generate examples from that state and that's going down the arrow rather than back up the arrow. So 188200. That's great. The third class is how do we learn the distinguishing characteristics of a state? Namely, how do we train our generative models on a large data set? In other words, up until now, I've told you that I have this arrow. I can I move down the arrow or move back, move back up the arrow. But how do I put parameters in those arrows so that I can learn from a lot of promoters what promoters look like and then generate more promoters? or learn from lots of exons what exons look like, and then generate more exons. So we want to train a generative model from a large data set, and we can learn to classify other either labeled or unlabeled examples. So let's see who's doing here on the third component. So the first is going down the arrow, the second is going up the arrow, and the third is figuring out what the arrow actually looks like. What is that modeling function 
that allows me to both generate sequences and also recognize sequences of a particular type. And how do I train that using either label data or unlabeled data? So 24000, that's great. Um, lastly, how's the pace so far? Um, am I going too fast, too slow, or just right? Okay, so um, 20 people just right, five above, one below. Um, okay, so what we're gonna be looking at is, first of all, an introduction to Bayesian inference. How do we make inferences about the world? So the first part that we're gonna try to do is um, learn about observations, about models, about Bayes rule, and Bayesian inference more broadly. Okay, so what's a generative model? A generative model allows you to express the forward, quote unquote, probability of an event given the hidden state of the world. So the way that you should think about, you know, reality more broadly, <laughs> and we're getting into the philosophical realm here with the matrix, the simulation hypothesis, or Plato's observations of the truth rather than the truth becoming directly visible ever. From ancient times, people have realized that through our senses, we're gathering observations, but we never truly know the truth about the state of the world, okay? All we gather are observations. So one example is you're sitting you know, in your room and there's a long corridor and all you can see is you know, what's going on outside, but you can't look up to the sky. The question is, what do you observe? You observe that there's sun, you observe that there's rain, you observe that there's snow, etc. And then you're trying to infer what season it is, for example. So if you see snow, chances are it's winter. If you see, I don't know, sun, chances are it's summer. Okay, so you're basically trying to infer something about the true state of the world given a set of observations. Even if you can look out the window, you might not know whether it's a giant storm system and it's gonna be raining for the next 10 hours or whether it's a you know, short storm and it's gonna pass. So there's some hidden information about the world that you can get from a satellite picture and so on and so forth, okay? So that's the distinction. So basically we are never transparent observers of truth. Truth is something that we make probabilistic inferences over and the observations is what we gather with our senses like our hearing our eyes or you know um etc okay so in this world above the, da the dot dash line it live models hypotheses and inferences about the world below the dash line are basically the experiences the observations and the data okay and basically what Bayesian inference allows you to do is estimate the probability of an observation given the season. So basically the generative model allows you to go down this arrow of what is the probability of observing each type of event given each type of state of the world, such as what is the probability of observing snow given winter. And what Bayesian inference is going to do is allow us to move back on these arrows. Okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, who feels that they're actually learning uh, something here, uh, sort of about this distinction between the hidden state of the world versus uh, the observations of what's observable today? Uh, it's great. Okay, so uh, quite a broad distribution, uh, 97670. Okay, so let's see, how do we reverse this error? Okay, so we have a hidden world that we don't have direct observation uh, of, like the truth, and we have some observations that are derived from that, but that's the only thing that, that we handle. So we can, uh, with our generative model, we can have the probability of rain given spring, and the probability of some data given a hypothesis. And then what Bayesian inference allows us to do is basically reverse that arrow and infer what is the probability that there's a giant storm system above me 
given that what I'm observing is rain for maybe 30 minutes, uh, you know, in a row. Okay. So the goal is to basically transform these forward facing arrows of what is the probability of observing rain given um, a season or the probability of observing my data given my hypothesis and turn that into the posterior probability of my hypothesis given that I've now observed the data. So my posterior is the probability after the observation, okay? So what we're gonna use is Bayes' rule to do this. We're gonna calculate the posterior probability of a hypothesis given the data as a function of this likelihood forward-facing probability of the data given the hypothesis. So what I have is P of rain given spring as part of my generative model. And what I want to infer is P of spring given rain. And the two tools that we're gonna be using for that is number one, the prior of what is the overall probability of spring given where I live, for example, and maybe even given what time of the year it is, if I have access to a calendar. Um, and the total uh, P of D, which is the total probability of my data summed over all of the uh, possible hypotheses. So this is the marginal likelihood of the data or the total model evidence, okay? Just the sum of the evidence. So first of all, let's prove this relationship here. It's kind of trivial to prove. So what we need to do is <clears throat> look at P of A intersection with B. That's this AB here. Uh, and express it as two functions. One is that out of the universe of all data in this gray uh, circle here, for example, there's 46 plus 24 plus six events in the world. So there's a total of 80, I don't know, objects in the world. Out of these 80 objects, 28 are A's and 10 are B's, okay? So out of these 80 objects, 28 are A's and 10 of these objects are B. So the question is, what is the probability of being both A and B, which is four out of 80, okay? So the probability of being A and B can be obtained in two possible paths. One is the probability of A, which is the fraction of all of the objects in the world that are actually red, and that's, you know, that emit a red spectrum, for example. Uh, and that's P of A, times the probability of also emitting a blue spectrum, given that I'm already emitting a red spectrum. So the probability of B given A. So the intersection here to get at four out of A, it's basically P of A given B times P of B, or P of B given A times P of A, okay? So first I'm asking what fraction of my whole world is A, and then what fraction of A's are also B's. Alternatively, I can just simply ask what fraction of my whole world is B, and what fraction of my B's are also A's, okay? So I can basically play this game of P of A given B, which is P of, uh, you know, A, uh, which is 28, given A, A given B is, um, the fraction of Bs, so basically given that I'm, that I'm already B, so I'm in this column here, given that I'm B, what is the probability of A? And that's just four out of 10, which is 40%. P of B given A, given A, I'm in this row here, so I'm in the red square, and then P of B given A is just uh, four out of 28, which is roughly 14.3%. And then P of A, is simply what fraction of everything in the world is A, and that's just 35%. So basically it's the red over the uh, total gray, including the red. And then P of B is 10 over, uh, you know, the total of 80. And then P of A given B times P of B, you get 5% if you work this way up, and P of B given A times P of A, you get 5% if you work that way. Okay, so given that I can calculate P of A intersection B one way or another way, 
I can just equate these probabilities, or P of A given B times P of B is the same as P of B given A times P of A. And then I can infer Bayes' rule super trivially by basically saying, well, P of A given B is simply that thing, B given A times P of A, divided by P of B. What we just got is super cool. I can basically infer this arrow that points from B to A given the arrow that points from A to B, which is exactly what we wanted from the beginning. We want the arrow from hypothesis to, from data to hypothesis, when all we have is the arrow from hypothesis to data. Okay, so let's see, who's 100% with me so far on um, Bayes' rule, Bayesian inference, this probability of hidden data, of, of hypothesis given data, and probably of data given hypothesis. Okay, so I only have 24 votes. Uh, oh, sorry, relaunch polling. There you go. Sorry about that. Awesome. Perfect. So 28 to 000. zero, zero. This is awesome. So, uh, oops. So, in uh, the world of Bayesian inference, we don't talk about A's and B's, we're talking about hypotheses and data. And basically the posterior probability is the probability of the hypothesis given the data. Why do I call it posterior? Because it's after I've seen the data. So this is the probability of my hypothesis after I've seen the data. Posterior means after. Prior is the same probability of my hypothesis, but before seeing an observation. So the probability of the hypothesis being true before collecting the data. So if in Boston it rains, I don't know, 10% of the time, then before you look out the window, your prior for rain is 10%. After you look out the window, your prior has something to do with, I don't know, the amount of shading that you see through your window and stuff like that. Okay? So that's the posterior probability of our hypothesis being true after the data has been collected and observed, and then this is before the data is collected. Okay? At the bottom here is P of D. This is the marginal, the total probability of collecting this data under all possible hypotheses. This is, you know, uh, as I'm observing a particular shade on my window, what is the total probability of seeing that shade, you know, integrated over all seasons. And then this green thing here is the forward facing probability. It's the likelihood, the probability of collecting this data when our hypothesis is true. So if I know that it's raining, what is the probability of seeing that shade of gray on my window, okay? So uh, why do we care about probabilistic sequence model, modeling? So first of all, biological data is noisy and probability provides a calculus for manipulating these models. And it's not limited to just yes or no answers. It can provide degrees of belief. And there's many, many common computational tools that are based on these probabilistic models. And today we're gonna be focusing on Markov chains and hidden Markov models. Okay, so let's see uh, how is the pace so far. We have basically talked about Bayesian inference, Bayes rule, the difference between observations and models, and sort of how to reverse that arrow from the hypothesis to the data and actually go have it go back up from the data to the hypothesis. Okay, so 20 people feel that it's just right, too, too fast, three too slow, this is very nice. All right, so now let's talk about Markov chains and hidden Markov models. So what is the difference here? The difference is that we don't have observations in isolation. We have a series of observations. If every morning I look at my window down this long tunnel and I see some kind of shading, then I can use information from one day to the next to improve my posterior probability of being in a particular season given my series of observations, okay? So what hidden Markov models allow you to do is couple this concept of Bayesian inference and this hidden state of the world versus the observed state of the world with a series of dependencies and transitions between your states. Those transitions between your states are governed by a Markov chain. A Markov chain is basically a uh, probability model that moves between different states 
according to some transition probabilities between them. So for example, I can move between, I don't know, summer and fall with some probability. I can move from fall to winter with some probability. And it's, in most cities around the world, this is you know, uh, a, a very well-behaved model. In, in Boston, this is an all-to-all -all transition probability, which can randomly transition between different seasons, and that's, you know, that's OK. It's probably not the best example for Boston, but for most cities around the world, there's a natural progression between the seasons, and you can model that using a Markov chain. Okay? The difference between a hidden Markov model and a Markov chain is that the Markov chain only has that chain, and in the hidden Markov model, that chain is coupled with a set of emission probabilities where we can decouple the hidden state of the world where the transitions are actually happening with the set of observations where the data is actually gathered. So the hidden state of the world determines the emission probabilities. For example, if there's a storm system above you, and the state transitions are governed by a Markov chain. And here, there's a disconnection between the hidden state of the world, the state that you're in currently, and the observations. Whereas in the Markov chain, there's no emissions. What you see is what you get. The next state only depends on the current state. There's no memory, and there's no hidden anything. Snow is snow, and that's the state that you're in. There's no hidden set of seasons. OK? So let's see who's with me so far on the uh, difference between Markov chains and um, hidden Markov models. Very cool. So um, 24310. All right, so let's put math behind all this, and hopefully that'll help make things clear. So what a hidden Markov model consists of is a series of observations, which is the observable thing that you sort of see down the tunnel through your wing. Okay? So that, that series of observations is sun, clouds, rain, rain, snow, snow, you know, sun, rain. That's your vector x of observations. Then coupled with that, at every time point i, you also have a parallel vector pi for the path or the parse of your sequence, which is basically the truth, quote unquote, or the inference about the world that you're making given the observations. So pi is this hidden path, the sequence of hidden states that generated each of these observations. Okay, So we're going to be talking about a set of emissions that basically go from a hidden state, pi i, to an observation, x i. And these emissions are going to be governed by an emission probability vector. This is going to be giving us the probability of observing the character that we have at position i. And in the genome, this could be, I don't know, a letter g given that the hidden state is promoter or intron or exon and so on and so forth, okay? So that's the probability of observing the character which is found at position i of my sequence, namely the character xi, given that the state at position i is in fact hidden state k. And we're going to denote that either p of xi given pi i equal k or the emission probability from state k of character xi. That's the emission probability of symbol xi from state k. Okay. On the transition probability side, we're going to be talking about the transition probability from state k to, st to state l. And these transitions always happen from one time point to the next time point. So we're going to be talking about the transition probability of our uh, path going from position i minus 1 to position i from state k to state l. Okay, So the transition matrix A, AKL, is the probability of going from state k at position i minus 1 to state l at position i, making that state transition. And that probability is the same 
regardless of what the I is at the beginning, my transition probability from summer to fall is exactly the same as at the end, I have exactly the same probability of transitioning from one state to the next state. So that's the transition vector. The emission vector is basically the, the, the transition matrix tells you from every state to every state. So this is a K by K matrix from all states to all other states. And then the emission vector is the probability of observing each of the characters from a state K. And again, it's a matrix because it gives me a vector for each of the states, but a set of vectors makes a matrix. Okay. And what we're going to be using is Bayes' rule to estimate what is the probability of my hidden state given my observation. But our generative model is only going to have these forward probabilities, which are going to be telling us what is the probability of emitting each of my characters given my hidden state. All right, so who's with me so far? <clears throat> okay, so 159200 is great. Okay, so here's an example going back into the realm of biology. So if you look at the GC content, that's the number of characters among ACG team that are G's or C's. If you look at the GC content surrounding the transcription start site, this is basically the place where transcription starts. In the human genome, you see that right where transcription always starts to generate any one of your genes, you have a very strong enrichment for GC and an even sharper enrichment for CPG. And you have some additional epigenomic signatures, such as being in a nucleosome free region, and so on and so forth. Okay? So these signals basically increase when you get near the transcription start site. And you know, this varies by species. For example, in you know, Bacillus subtilis, there's actually a depletion of CGs near the transcription start site. Okay? So depending on the species, we would like to model the probability of being in a promoter region given the GC content. Why do I care about that? Because, you know, there, we didn't get a tablet like from the mountain that basically tell us where all 20,000 genes in the human genome start. No, what we got is the genome sequence. And what we have to do now is figure out how does this genome function? Where are the functional elements in this genome? So what's these mark of models and these hidden mark of models allow us to do is model as I scan through a sequence, how do I know that I'm, a, I'm in a promoter region? So we're going to be modeling the genome as two states. There's going to be the P, there's going to be the P state, which is a promoter, and the B state, which is the background. And we're going to model the different nucleotide compositions of the background versus the promoter regions. So maybe in the background, I expect 25% frequency for all uh, four nucleotides. But in the promoter regions, I have much more frequent Gs and Cs. It can go up to you know, 40% uh, G, 40% C. So 80% of my letters are in fact Cs and Gs, as opposed to only 20% of my letters being As and Ts. Okay? So this is going to be a generative model, which is going to be basically telling us the probability of each character given the promoter. And we're going to be reversing these probabilities using Bayes' rule. And I also, from studying the genome, see that this increase in GC lasts about 20 nucleotides, and maybe promoters last about 100 nucleotides. Uh, sorry, non-promoters last about 100 nucleotides. Okay? So who's with me so far on sort of these uh, parameters of my model? So basically, you know, Moses came down from the mountain and basically told me, 
the probability of A's and C's and G's and T's is 25% in the background, 80% in promoter regions for G's and C's, uh, and then promoters are on average 20 nucleotides and uh, non-promoters are on average 100 nucleotides. Uh, so the answer is 24100. And then Joe, you have a question. Why don't you go ahead? But yeah, so I was just wondering how you learn sort of like the uh, transition matrix parameters, like that 20 base pair sort of transition thing. Yeah. So, the, so this new is, species. Yeah. So this is exactly what we're going to do when we get to the learning. So remember how we're going to uh, cover three components. We're going to look at emitting, recognizing, assuming that the arrows are known, and then we're going to look at learning in the last part. But basically, very briefly, we're going to uh, count these emission and transition frequencies, and then use those as a maximum likelihood estimate of those posterior of those um, uh, emission and transition probabilities. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? You can uh, type it into the chat or just raise your hand. Okay, so now, given this study of the biological world, I'm going to now encode my knowledge about the biological world, where you know. I studied a bunch of regions and I saw that on average these were the lengths and these were the frequencies. So now I'm going to go and build a model, which is a hidden Markov model that allows me to capture what I know about the world. And here's where I'm going to encode each of these pieces of knowledge. First of all, the emission probabilities are going to allow me to encode these 25% uh, equal frequency for each of the four characters each of the four DNA letters. And uh, that's in the background region. And in a GC rich region, we're gonna have 80% of the characters B, C, or G, and then 20% of the characters B, A, or T in equal proportions. And then I'm gonna have a transition probability out of a background state of 1%, which basically means that on average, I expect to exit that state one time out of a hundred trials. So I'm flipping a coin and this coin is so, so biased that 99% of the time it tells me stay where you are in the background state. And 1% of the time it tells me you can enter the promoter state now. And once I enter the promoter state in the mark of chain part of the model, I then stay with probability 95%, but one chance out of 20, I exit back into the background state, okay? So that means that on average, background is going to last about 100 time steps, and then promoter is going to last about 20 time steps. So who's missing so far? OK. And then uh, so 20. Uh, five, one, zero, zero. And then the um, next question is, how's the pace? Awesome. That's great. So uh, 18 people spot on, three slightly above, three slightly below. That's great. Um, okay, so we can now use Heater Markov models to detect, oh, sorry, there's a question in the chat. Um, now they're measuring empirically. Are these probabilities just biologically known or learned through HMMs? So yeah, they're learned empirically. Uh, so you know, we, we're going to talk about learning afterwards. Um, OK, so that's one example. That's promoter regions. But I want you to sort of have a broader mind and say, well, you could detect GC-rich regions using two states with different nucleotide composition where the hidden states are GC rich or AT rich, and the emissions slash observations are going to be nucleotides. Okay, so that first column is basically this. So you guys should be totally on top of that. The second column is maybe we could use that to detect conserved regions. I don't know if you guys remember, but in lecture two, I showed you this sort of conservation track, and I told you that this is a hidden Markov model with two states, and the different states have different conservation levels. So as I scan through the genome, I can look for those little stars underneath the alignment that basically tells me that something is conserved or not conserved, 
and I can build a hidden markup model that shifts between conserved and not conserved. I could also, uh, and then the emissions are going to be the level of conservation. For example, if I see a star or I don't see a star, or I could actually measure the number of species that have the same letter or the percentage of those species or the phylogenetic length of the tree where that letter is conserved and so on and so forth. Okay. I could also use that to detect protein coding regions. So there's a chat question. Can HMMs accommodate strict limits? Say we knew that a promoter must be at least 10 base pairs or no, no, they can't. So you'll have to use some kind of other um, uh, kind of um, model to do that. Basically, markup chains are memoryless. Memoryless means that at position 7,000 of being in a background state, I have exactly the same probability of staying still in the background state for another you know, 7,001 time, okay? So um, there's no memory. Just because you've been in background state for 100 iterations in a row, doesn't mean that you should now put all of your money in the probability of transition to promoter. You still have exactly the same probability. Over a long time, you're very unlikely to see a hundred transitions back to itself in a row, but at any one time, that probability doesn't change. All right. Can't they fix that by creating 10 uh, hidden nodes, uh, which are all like GC rich, and there is probability of one transition in between them, so that that part of Markov chain would uh, have almost exactly 10 nucleotides, because there is probability of one transition in between those identical states until you get out of the region. Yeah, 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 yeah. So certainly that 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 is true, but that's all probabilistic. If you look at you know the length of time that I'm spending in promoter regions, it's probably centered around I don't know uh, 20 nucleotides, but sometimes it's going to be 21, sometimes it's going to be 22, and so on and so forth. So there's some probability distribution around those 20. I don't always exit exactly after 20 time steps, and similarly for the background region there's probably gonna be some probability distribution around 100 time points. So sometimes I'll transition out right away. So other times I'll, I'll sort of roughly stay there about 100 times before I see one, and there's absolutely no memory about that. But over thousands of runs, then yeah, sure, you know, there's gonna be some distribution around 100. All right, any other questions or comments? So this is, um, you know, the first example, GC rich region. The second example is conserved region. The third one is protein coding exons. So how can I detect protein coding exons? Maybe I want to have two states. And these states have different trinucleotide composition. One state corresponds to protein coding, one state corresponds to non-coding. What are the hidden states? Coding exon versus, I don't know, non-coding, intron or intergenic. And what do I emit? Triplets of nucleotides. Maybe I want to detect protein coding conservation. Maybe the two states are going to be my uh, different evolutionary signatures for protein coding versus non-coding. And then the hidden states are going to be coding versus non-coding. And the emissions are now going to be triplets of nucleotides and their conservation patterns. Or I could emit, uh, I, could, I could detect protein coding gene structures. Not just whether something's protein coding or not, but the start, the end, et cetera. And um, that, you know, basically there could be a start codon, an end codon, an exon, an intron, and I could have 20 different states, each with a different set of compositional and conservation patterns and a very specific structure of transitions between these states. For example, a first exon, a last exon, a middle exon, uh, an untranslated region, an intron, uh, you know, with, uh, multiple memories for what uh, number of codons I've seen, uh, whether I'm on the plus strand or minus strand, etc. So basically, this can be a lot more complicated. And then the observations or the emissions can be codons, nucleotides, splice sites, etc. Or I could detect chromatin states with 40 different chromatin states. And then the states could be enhancers, promoters, transcribed, etc. And then the emissions could be the vector of all 
epigenomic modifications at each of those states. So the reason why I'm showing you all this is that we're actually going to see the HMM model come back at various lectures. And this is, you know, just a foreshadowing of those upcoming lectures. Okay. But for now, what you should remember is that we have a set of observations. We have a set of models that are sort of living in the hidden part of the world. And then we can use Bayes' rule to reverse the arrow from down to up to do Bayesian inference. And what hidden Markov models are, are basically this Bayesian inference coupled with a Markov chain that's memoryless, so that we have a set of transition probabilities and a set of emission probabilities. Okay? So now that we have our first hidden Markov model, let's use it to do some really cool examples. So what we're going to do is calculate <coughs> <coughs> the joint probability of a given sequence and the parse of that sequence, namely the probability of a vector x and an adjoining vector pi being observed together. So uh, let's see. How do we score a given annotation, a given path or a given parse of my sequence, given a sequence of observations? So remember my promoter model and my background model? So here, if it was a promoter region, I would expect to see many Gs and Cs. If it's a background region, I expect to see roughly a quarter of the letters being Cs and Gs and three quarters of the letters being As and, C and Ts. Okay, so what do you think is more likely here, promoter or background? Let's do a poll. So A means promoter and B means background. So what do you think is more likely given the sequence that I'm looking in front of? Uh, a is promoter, B is background. So what do you think is more likely given the set of characters that I'm looking at in front of me? So with a very high probability, you expect that this is basically a promoter region. And indeed, this is what most of you guys have voted. So 94% uh, of the people said, yeah, well, that's probably a promoter region. Oh, sorry, that's probably a background region. And you were right, but it's a little more complicated. Maybe uh, we should actually calculate the total probability of being in a promoter state versus the total probability of being in a background state um, and you know, figure out what is more likely. And maybe there's a third option where I'm in a promoter state only for here, where I have GGC, and then I'm in the background state for the remainder, and I transition from background to promoter back to background. Okay? So let's see what are these probabilities giving us. So how do I score this? Well, it's super simple, right? It's, well, the, the total probability of this observation a, T, T, A, G, G, T, C, T, A, and this path, B, 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 is the 0.4 probability of starting in either a background or a promoter state. Maybe, you know, that's uninformative. Um, and then the probability of emitting an A, given that I'm in the stage B, times the probability of transitioning from state B to state B, the probability of emitting a T, given state B, times the probability of transitioning from B to B, and so on and so forth, okay? So the joint probability of observing my sequence x and the specific path phi, given that the path is all background and the sequence is the sequence that we talked about, that is the probability of starting at a given state and then emitting a character from that state, transitioning from that state to the next state, from that state to the next state, and then emitting from that state to the next character, and then transitioning from that state to the next state, and then emitting that character from that state, and so on and so forth. So the total joint probability of P of X comma P pi is P of X given pi times P of, X, P of pi, and that's basically the probability of emissions given the path times the probability of the path, and it's basically that simple multiplication. So that probability, which we're, you know, the whole class, like we're 95% confident that this whole thing is more likely to be background than promoter, that gives us <laughs> uh, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 9. This is ridiculously small. Why is it so small? 
you can type in the chat window or raise your hand. Why is the probability of observing all promoter given that uh, and, and that particular path, why is that so small? Uh, that one half uh, at the beginning, oh, why is there a one half? So that's just the initiation state. You can use that initiation state as um, an uninformative probability of 0.5. You could use the probability uh, of initiating either at P or B as simply the stationary distribution of my Markov chain of how much longer am I to spend uh, time in the P state versus the B state and so on and so forth. Okay. So the answers are all very good because the sequence is long, because there are many. So um, Sonia says, uh, oh, sorry. Um, Thomas says because the sequence is long, and then um, Ari says because there are many possible sequences that are all background. Tatiana says because there are many equally likely sequences in a given state, and Joe says there are a lot of combinatorial possibilities. So that's all completely correct. So basically, the reason why P is so small, namely roughly one in a billion, is because, or five in a billion, is because there are basically five billion, uh, you know, there's a billion possibilities for what that sequence could be and what the parsings could be. And yes, the observation that I have is one observation out of billions of possibilities. And that's why I have, uh, you know, that, that tiny little probability. So what we should really be looking for is how much more likely is it that I'm in a background state versus a promoter state. So what we're going to be doing is a likelihood ratio between two different hypotheses, two different parses of the uh, observation. So with the same observation, I can basically parse the sequence as all B, or I can parse the sequence as all P. And the probability of that is again multiplying through. But now, Every single time I see an AP rich character, I pay a bigger penalty because I multiply by 10% rather than 25%. So I lose a lot in the A's and G's, oh, sorry, A's and T's, but I gain in the G's and C's. But overall, do I lose more or gain more? Well, it turns out that the total probability here is two times 10 to the minus nine, which is, you know, much smaller, like three times smaller than five times 10 to the minus nine, okay? The other thing to realize is that it's not just the emission probabilities that come into account, it's also the transition probabilities. So here, every single time I stay in a promoter state, because promoter states are less frequent across the genome, so on average, I'm more likely to be in a background state than in a promoter state, because promoter states are less likely in general across the genome, I basically expect to have, um, you know, I pay a bigger penalty for staying in a, back, in a promoter state for so long. So overall, when I'm looking at the likelihood ratio, the, uh, you know, small loss that I have each time is also contributing to this lower probability, okay? So <clears throat> I can basically take the likelihood ratio between the two probabilities and basically say that I'm three times more likely to be in a background state than in a promoter state given the sequence that I have. And now the cool part is that the given the sequence that I have is the same in both cases and therefore they uh, balance themselves out and they get eliminated. So when I'm, when I'm doing my uh, you know, Bayesian inference, this marginal model evidence, this P of D, is gonna be the same for all possible hypotheses. So most of the time I'm gonna be ignoring this and simply comparing uh, hypotheses based on the likelihood and the prior multiplied together to give me the posterior, ignoring the marginal because that marginal is gonna be the same throughout, okay? So, uh, Okay, so we basically now have the, pro the all promoter and all background probabilities. Let's now test one more option where we parse the first part as background, the middle part as promoter, and then the last part as background again. 
Why? Because we're winning by paying a lower penalty of 40% emission rather than 25% emission uh, for each of those characters, even though we pay a slightly higher penalty for emitting a T from a background state, sorry, from a promoter state. So that basically gives us a 1.6 times to the minus nine. And this is actually much less likely than the old promoter version. And the reason is that every single time I transition, I pay a much bigger penalty because I only have one chance out of 20 of transitioning. So if I transition twice, I basically pay you know, a very large penalty rather than staying in the same state all the time. So let's see who's with me so far. Uh, that's awesome. People are following very well. So 23, 3, 2, 0, 0. And then how's the pace? Okay, very cool. So um, we have basically uh, 23 people in the middle, four above and one below, suggesting it's slightly too fast, but we're doing good. All right, so we basically introduced this whole concept of Bayesian inference. We introduced Markov chains and heater Markov models, and then we saw how we can calculate the joint probability of one sequence sparse combination p of x comma pi let's now see how we can find the best parse so what we did is that we scored three possible parses let's now see how can i find the best parse so uh, what i want to introduce you to now is this matrix that we're going to be filling in across these two lectures so we're going to be looking at six algorithms for heat market models. And then they're going to be in three rows corresponding to the three challenges that I mentioned earlier of emitting, recognizing, and learning. So emitting is this forward probability of asking how likely is it to observe this observation given the hidden path. Recognizing is inferring what is the most likely hidden path given the observations. And then learning is figuring out what does this arrow actually look like. So, these are going to be the three rows of scoring, decoding, and learning. And the two columns are going to be whether I do this over one path or over all paths. So, don't worry about this column yet. We're, uh, we're about to get there. But now we basically saw how we can score the sequence and the path being jointly observed. And that gives us the probability of the path and emissions as a tuple. Now we want to ask what is the total, uh, so what is the maximum likelihood path over all possible paths? So uh, Tatiana says, but in a long sequence, there are too many possible hidden state sequences to compare them all and check which has the highest likelihood given observed emission signal. I agree with you completely, Tatiana. So basically, we could <laughs> score every single path. You can basically say, okay, great. We scored one path, we scored another path, we scored all path, uh, third path. Great, why don't I score all possible paths? Well, there is an exponential number of paths. So um, if I search over all possible paths, I basically have a choice of you know, two states in the first position, two states in the second position, two states in the third position. So I have two times two times two times two. And for a sequence of a thousand nucleotides, I have two to the thousand possible paths. So I don't want to score every single possible path. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use an algorithm, hint, hint, wink, wink, that allows us to search over an exponential number of possible solutions, an exponential number of possible paths, and to find the provably optimal path in polynomial time. How do I do that? I expect all of you guys to be typing frantically the answer in the chat window. And I'm gonna use 
dynamic programming. So uh, we're going to basically use dynamic programming, the same thing that we saw over the last two lectures. We're now going to see again in the context of this very cool Bayesian inference in a hidden Markov uh, model uh, setting. So what are we going to do? We're going to basically assume that we're given the model parameters, that somebody told us what the emission parameters are and what the transition parameters are. And given a sequence of emissions, we're going to infer the most likely hidden state. OK? Are we going to do that? We're basically going to say, out of all of the states that I could have possibly traversed in the n characters of a 1,000 nucleotides, for example, that I go through, we want to find the path that maximizes the total joint probability, P of x comma pi. That total joint probability is whatever the start probability is, and we could ignore that if we assume that it plays very little uh, of an effect, um, you know, an informative prior, for example. And then, after we've started, a product of emitting a character from the first position, given the state that I'm in at the first position, time transitioning from that state to the next state. And then emitting a character at the next position from the state in the next position, and then transitioning. And then emitting another character from the state and then transitioning. Emitting another character from the state and transitioning. Okay? So I'm trying to maximize that total joint probability. Okay? So we can evaluate any path through the hidden states given the emitted sequences. And we can find the best path by trying all possibilities, which is obviously not practical because there's an exponential number path. And instead, we're going to be using dynamic programming and something known as the Viterbi algorithm. Uh, developed by, you know, Dr. Viterbi, uh, who was actually an MIT alum. So we're going to be storing the partial computation as for all dynamic programming uh, settings. And that partial computation is going to be the maximum score to position i through state k. Okay? So going back to this, what I'm going to do is compute a Viterbi variable for every position, uh, you know, along the columns here, and for every state along the rows here. And I'm going to assume that if I have already computed the Viterbi variable at the previous time point, that I can reuse these results to then compute the next uh, Viterbi variable at the next time point as a function of the previous uh, variables. Okay. So we're going to store the maximum score to position i through state k and define this Viterbi variable at state k uh, at position i, which is the probability of the most likely path that goes through state k at position i. So of all of the paths that I could have chosen, I'm basically asking if there's a path that goes through this, what is the maximum score for that? But you know, in the end, when I get to the end, I'm going to do trace back, and I might find that the optimal path actually goes through this other state, not through this state. But that's OK, because I only do the trace back at the end. But all the way to the end, I'm going to be recomputing the uh, partial score from the, so the maximum score uh, up until this point, going through this state at that position as a function of all the previous ones. So we're going to use this, this probability of the most likely path through this current state, k, at position i. We're going to use it to compute, we're going to use that variable to compute the maximum score to position i plus 1 through each state, k prime, as a function of the maximum over all possible previous starting points, reusing the same Viterbi variable. So it's going to be a very simple computation, and we're just going to include the emission score and the cost of the transition. So the next variable, Vk at position i plus 1, is going to be some kind of maximum over all possible previous maxima 
times the transition probabilities from these previous maxima, taking the maximum over all previous states, J, at the previous position, I. And then, after I've chosen that maximum transition and previous score, I'm going to be paying for the current emission probability from the current time form. Okay? And the reason why I can do this, the reason why dynamic programming works, is because there is actually optimal substructure. Namely, the best path through a given state better be the best path to the previous state and the best transition from the previous state to the state and the best path to the end state. Because if it wasn't building up on these best paths, if there was something that's better building up on these best paths, then I, that means that I can get an even better score and therefore that the previous was not optimal and therefore there's a contradiction. So with this cut and paste argument again, straight from 6046, I can basically reason that the best path has to go through a series of optimal solutions. And because of that, I can actually use dynamic program. So let's you know, dive a little bit more into the detail. So what we're going to be doing is initializing the first row, sorry, the first column, and then walking column from column, computing this variable variable as a function of all of the previous states. And then when we get to the end, we're going to trace back remembering each time the maximum pointers that we're gonna uh, that that gave us this maximum choice we're gonna follow these maximum pointers back just like we were following pointers for aligning uh, characters to characters now we're aligning sequences to, uh, to states and in terms of runtime it's gonna take us k squared n because for every position, I'm going to be computing the maximum over k possible states at the previous time point. And then the total space is just filling in that matrix, which is order kn. Okay? And then the key, key insight is this iterative computation, where the current column can be computed as a function of the maximum of the previous column. Okay? To make things uh, even more explicit. I'm computing the current Viterbi variable, which is the maximum likelihood path that ends at state k at position i. I'm computing this as a function of the current emission probability, which is going to be different for every such state. So I'm choosing whether the maximum is higher here or higher there. So in order to compute that maximum, I better pay for the cost of emitting, because there might be another state where the emission probability is much higher and therefore the cost, the penalty of emission is actually much smaller. So I might prefer a state that has a higher emission probability. But that's not enough. I want to also choose a state that has a high transition probability from the previous state to the state to the current state. So I have to factor in the transition probability from the previous state. And I also have to factor in, factor in the maximum possible probability with which I end up at that state j in position i minus 1, which incorporates within it the emission probability because that's in this part of the equation. So basically, I include in the current maximum the emission probability for that character from that state. And then the transition probability is factored into this maximum. So intuitively, I'm trying to choose the best combination of previous score and transition. Because this state might have an awesome score, but a very costly transition. This state might have a very poor transition, uh, sorry, a very poor score, but an awesome transition. And instead, I want to take a state that has both a high score to that state and a high transition from high transition probability from that previous state to the current state. Okay. So who's with me so far? Uh, let's see. 
awesome. So um, 15, 7, 3, and only two people are below uh, 50%. So uh, we're doing good. So um, OK, any questions so far? So uh, let me ask about the pace. Okay, so I have 18 people just right, six people above, and one person below. So we're going just a tidbit too fast. So um, this is basically the key insight. Again, I don't expect you to just take an hour and a half and get everything at lecture. I expect you to sort of review this and think about it and you know, read the book and uh, you know, make progress that way. So in the notes, V underscore K is calculated with a summation over the previous transitions. But here we just use the max over j. Are they are both computationally valid? So vk is calculated with the summation of the previous transitions of all j. That's exactly oh. So this is the maximum over the previous j, not a summation. We're going to see the summation very shortly when we talk about uh, the top right of these algorithms. But right now we're just taking the maximum over the the previous day. Okay, so this was basically the Viterbi algorithm that gives us the best parse pi star summing, sorry, taking the maximum over all possible paths. So even though there's an exponential number of paths, I can calculate this intermediate variable each time get all the way to the end getting that variable and then simply choose the maximum here and then trace back remembering all of the previous pointers and that gives me a parse of my previous sequence okay so now let's see how we can find the total probability p of x summing over all paths okay so now we're entering ba -ba -ba -bum, the right column so the right column is basically going to be looking over all possible paths. What does that even mean, all possible paths? Let me give an example. So when we said, uh, you know, way back here, that the uh, probability of emitting this particular sequence and this particular path jointly, that joint probability of this uh, sequence and that path is very, very small. You could basically say, well, what is the total probability of emitting that sequence, period? So how do I calculate that total probability of emitting that sequence? Well, I have to basically calculate the probability of emitting it given this path, and the probability of emitting it given this other path, plus the probability of emitting it given this other path, each weighted by their corresponding probabilities. So overall, what I want to do is calculate the total probability summed over all possible paths for that one particular sequence. So this is kind of complicated. How do I do that? What I want to do is somehow sum through that matrix of you know, every state at every position. I want to sum through all of these paths the total probability. Okay? So one way to do that is to basically say, well, what can generate this sequence? I can simply choose the maximum path, the maximum likelihood path, and I know how to calculate this using the Viterbi algorithm. So I can choose that maximum uh, path, and then simply just report the total probability of that path. But the problem, as we saw, is that even with the best parts, which was all background, I have a tiny little probability captured there. All promoter, you know, wasn't that far off. It was only, you know, three times less likely. And there are, you know, two to the n possible paths. So every one of these paths has some small probability. And the best path, the best parts of my sequence, captures a tiny fraction of that 
total sum probability over all paths. So what I would like to do is not just simply take the best path, but the sum over all possible paths, okay? So how do I do that? What I wanna do is take the sum over all paths of this P x comma pi, which is basically the sum of emitting x given pi weighted by the probability of each path, and because there's an exponential number of paths, I have um, you know, a challenge here. And the challenge is that I can actually, um, you know, the, the solution to the challenge is that I can actually use the same exact framework as I used for the Viterbi algorithm to now calculate an intermediate variable that stores the total summed probability to get to that previous state at that previous position. And if I have the sum all the way to here and the sum all the way to there and the sum all the way to here and the sum all the way to there, then I can calculate the sum all the way to here by taking the sum over all previous probabilities, over all previous sums, each weighted by the transition probability. And of course, the overall sum weighted by the emission probability from the current state. So instead of defining this Viterbi variable, which gave me the maximum over all paths, now I'm gonna define the forward variable that gives me the sum over all paths. And that sum I can calculate exactly in the same way by initializing you know, with zero to everything and then summing through and all the way to the end. And in the end, instead of just taking the maximum, I'm just gonna sum up all of these probabilities and that's gonna give me the total probability of going through my model. Um, and the, the proof for that is I can expand out this four probability vector, which is the sum over all possible paths all the way to i minus one, with the probability of observing all the way to i minus one, and that probability of the path all the way to i minus one, followed by the next emission and the current state. And that whole thing, summing over all possible current states, I can start peeling off this probability sum, which is that sum over all possible paths going all the way to the previous time point, K, plus the emission, plus the transition. You mean, uh, I mean, you know, also in factoring in the emission and also factoring in the transition. And that whole thing is basically the same function evaluated at the inter, you know, at the previous time point. And that basically means that I can now calculate the forward probability sum as a function of itself. And since the uh, emission doesn't depend on the K, I can just move that emission probability out. And that gives me exactly this formula for updating the emission probability each time. Sorry, the, the total forward probability each time. So that gives me the total probability of going through each of the states at each of the time points, and that gives me the total uh, sum probability, okay? So who's with me so far on the, um, um, on the forward probability? So it's the same thing as we did before, but instead of taking the maximum, I'm now taking the sum, and I'm adding up the total probability flowing through that entire matrix at each point, reusing the computation from the previous uh, column each time, and then adding this up all the way to the end. Okay, so 12, 11, 1, 2, 0, this is awesome. And then lastly, uh, who feels that they've learned some uh, cool things today? Awesome, this is really great. Good, so we have um, 10, 10, 2, 2, 0, this is great. 
All right, so that's the lecture for today. So we're meeting again on uh, Tuesday to do the second half of HMMs. And then uh, all of the slides were posted already. So they're, you know, uh, the slide for both lectures. But on uh, Tuesday, we're gonna do the second half. And remember tomorrow, we have the mentoring session. So what I want all of you guys to do is, number one, uh, review, you know, choose a paper, either from the list that I gave you or from anywhere. Describe the data sets in those papers, describe the methods, look for the code, look for the data, and then fill out this sheet that basically says, um, here's, the, uh, here's the evaluation, not, not the evaluation, but here's the uh, summary of uh, these previous papers. Uh, so use the link on the Google Documents, upload your, um, uh, one pagers and also upload your um, the paper itself and then at the mentoring session we're basically going to describe what we do uh, for the next week which is that you guys are going to be proposing your top three ideas so we're going to go through all of that uh, in the mentoring session tomorrow all right sound good so um, let me uh, put the link to the google doc so email the class list if you lost the link to the Google Doc. I don't want to put the link to the Google Doc online because, um, you know, I want this to be private. I want this to be just for the folks taking the class as registered. So if you don't have the link to the Google Doc, just ask the TAs and we'll send it to you. Okay? All right, guys. See you tomorrow. Bye.